Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode in our Q2 series of TGIF. Thank goodness it's Fortinet. I am Alex york Bright, the Director of Vendors Business Development for Fortinet here at Exclusive and I'll be joined here today by Carmen Villegas, the Director of Vendor Business Development for Sentinel One, Juan Quintero and Simon Dejardin, our system engineers we're part of our, our fantastic engineering team here at Exclusive. Today's topic is protecting the workforce, company assets and data, leveraging Fortinet and Sentinel One. Next slide. So many of our regulars will have seen this slide before, but for those first time attendees out there, I'd uh, just like to take a minute to give you a brief overview of some of our differentiators. Our uh, unique contribution to the industry is that we specialize in cybersecurity and the cloud and maintaining specialization within a narrow set of best of breed vendors. In this way, exclusive networks assist the channel community with vendor specific and generic training, sales, design, implementation, pre-staging, and of course, supply chain and logistics, locally and globally. Filling in the void and the skills gap helping many different types of partners to supply and deliver relevant multi-vendor solutions to their customers. And of course, we're real people. Next slide, please. So please make sure if you haven't done so already that you're following us on social media to stay up to date with the latest news, offerings and updates that we're putting out there. We're currently running our first So You Think You Know Fortinet quiz of Q2. And there's a variety of uh, interesting, um, fun and informative questions available on the, the quiz to help broaden your Fortinet knowledge. So if you'd like to test your metal, you'll be in with a chance of winning one of four uh, $100 Amazon gift cards. Please go follow us and take part in the quiz. And at this point, I would like to hand over to the extremely capable Juan Quintero to kick things off and start off with today's agenda. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, everyone, on behalf of Exclusive and myself for being here with us today. Uh, so today we are going to uh, kind of follow in the flow of what we've been talking about in the uh, last couple of episodes of TGIF, uh, where we've been focusing on branch deployments and endpoint protection and remote work. Uh, a little bit more on the remote work because obviously what is happening and uh, even though I think personally we're starting to see um, kind of like a glimpse of light at the end of the tunnel maybe at least in, in some parts of the country um, many experts they you know they foresee that what's happening is going to go on for a while and uh, you know some of the investments that are going to be made uh, are going to uh, be for for the long term uh, so we're going to do something a little different today. Instead of just talking about Fortinet, we're going to talk about Fortinet uh, working in conjunction with Sentinel-1. Um, and I'm going to go through some slides, uh, talk about the Fortinet teleworker solution options, and then we're going to talk about also the sd wan because there is an sd wan play in all of this. And then we're going to talk about, uh, or I'm going to talk about Sentinel-1. And at the end, we're going to do some demonstrations of some of the topics in the agenda. Okay, so I like to always start with kind of like a little story line. Uh, so uh, a long time in a galaxy far, far away, uh, everybody went to the office and uh, we all, you know, worked together there as a team in an environment that um, was controlled. The network was controlled. Uh, the physical security was uh, usually controlled. Um, and everything flowed through a um, essentially th there was very little um, questions. So if you configure your network properly, you had a perimeter device that was seeing all the traffic uh, going in and out. You had segmentation in your network, uh, which means that IOT was hopefully separate from uh, the corporate network and wireless was hopefully uh, separate from wired connections and servers were separate from uh, regular workstations. And another thing that I like to point out is the physical oversight, right? So when you're in the office and your boss is walking around, 
you're not very likely to be doing things on your computer that you shouldn't. But now that we're at home, that changes things because um, as much as we all hate being micromanaged, um, you know, sometimes having somebody looking over your shoulder, uh, it, it also keeps you from doing things that you shouldn't. But, uh, you know, as you guys know what's going on, uh, here we are today. And this is probably the reality for most people. I know it's the reality uh, for all of us here at Exclusive. We are working from home. And uh, the dynamic changes because now a lot of the times the network is not controlled. Uh, the devices may or may not be controlled. Um, and the way that the business dynamic was structured is not going to be feasible, uh, feasible going forth in order to ensure maximum protection and visibility over what the employees are doing all the time. So we have some people using VPN to access um, corporate resources that are at the corporate site behind the perimeter firewall. That is the ideal uh, usage for VPN. We also have uh, folks using VPN to get to the internet. Um, and I have this, um, information here and I want you guys to kind of pay attention to this because this is going to play a factor now um, that we are using VPN a lot more. And then we have some employees that are accessing cloud applications directly. And as you can see, uh, you know, with this graphic, you have uh, different amounts of oversight with each of those options. So first I want to talk about uh, the Fortinet teleworker solution options as well as the cost. Okay. And, you know, from the bottom up, the first one should be uh, everybody's at least their first step until they figure out what they want to do next. And that is to enable VPN connectivity. And all of the 40 gates have VPN built in out of the box, both IPsec and SSL and it is free to use. There is no license for VPN usage. Now, why is there a little dollar sign down here? Well, that is because if you do want to enable two-factor authentication through 40 token, which you can do, then you must purchase a 40 token license bundle with however many tokens you need, and then you are going to assign uh, those tokens to the users. Those tokens do cost money, okay? Now the other two options, one of which you guys should be very familiar. So right at the top, we have the option to send a smaller model 40 gate to an employee. And this is probably an option that um, for power users or very important users in the organization that would likely be targets of uh, stuff like phishing attacks and, and things like that and handle important classified information, confidential information, um, financial information, it makes sense that you would send a 40 gate to the home, which can be pre-configured in advance and managed remotely uh, through either 40 cloud or 40 manager. And it's very easy to just plug it in and get connectivity. And once connectivity has been assured, then you can do some further configuration. The option on the middle, uh, some of you may have seen it if you have attended any of the Fortinet uh, teleworker webinars that they have had in the, in the uh, past month or so, uh, they briefly touched on this, but you can actually ship out a um, AP to a uh, remote worker and have that be the way that they connect uh, to the internet. So VPN using hardware. VPN using hardware, we have two options. Um, the first one, should be very, you should guys should be very familiar with that because we've talked about that and we've demonstrated uh, that. And if you guys have talked to me, I have uh, also demonstrated how easy it is um, to set up and get going with VPN on a 40 gate. And if you haven't, uh, Simon later on in the webinar is going to again, demonstrate uh, some of the configuration that you need to do to get VPN going. Now, the second option at the bottom uh, is one that uh, many of you may be unfamiliar with. And essentially, you're probably wondering the same thing I was. It's like, how can you possibly manage an AP that is at somebody's house from the 40 gate that is at the office? And essentially, 
Um, if you're familiar with the protocol used to upload um, the management of switches and APs in FortiGate, it's called CapWAP, which in later versions of the FortiOS is been built in now into the uh, security uh, telemetry, the security telemetry option that you can enable on the interfaces. Uh, so what you have to do is, and you would do this in advance before shipping the AP to your remote worker, but essentially you log into the AP and you set the management IP as the WAN IP of the 40 gate. And then on the WAN interface of the 40 gate, you have to enable that um, CapWAP or security fabric telemetry option. And in that way, you can now serve that SSID that you were serving at the office at your employee's um, house. And they will be connected and the traffic as well as uh, your ability to see what they're doing will be funneled through the 40 gate. Uh, now, these two options are similar in the way that they use hardware. Uh, but if you think about this, uh, one option is a lot more feasible from the cost perspective than the other. A 40 gate requires licensing and that in addition to support, right? The all hardware requires support, but that licensing needs to be renewed. Now that licensing may make sense for certain users, but that is an additional cost that for as long as this arrangement goes on, you'll have to renew that. Whereas an AP, you really only have to worry about the support. So the AP uh, provides many of the capabilities and is a far cheaper value proposition. And of course, both you have the admin over here, which is also working from home, able to see that uh, from either 40 cloud, 40 manager, 40 analyzer, depending on the deployment. So VPN using hard, uh, software, we have two options. We have IPsec and SSL. Fortinet in their uh, presentations, they really um, put emphasis on IPsec VPN. And reason being is that with IPsec VPN, you can leverage the hardware more. It works at a lower uh, layer in the OSI model. So you can get more tunnels essentially. You can get more bang for, for your buck with IPsec. And as you can see here, there is site to site, hub and spoke, as well as remote access. And you can use uh, a 40 client that is free for VPN access, or you can use the native client on the OS to set up IPsec. Personally, I love to use IPsec tunnels for site to site connectivity. Um, that's how I connect from the 40 gate that I have here at home to the 40 gates in the office. <clears throat> However, for remote access, I prefer SSL, or I should call it TLS. And the reason being is, um, and I, I've kind of illustrated uh, what I think are the more important differences. There are more, these are not the only differences. But to me, the important thing is that because of um, how SSL VPN operates, it can give you more granular access control over being able to specifically give users access to applications that they need and nothing more. And here we have a quick one, two, three, four step guide to configuring SSL. I think that uh, Simon's gonna talk about that briefly uh, later on as well, but essentially you need your users and your groups. Uh, two factor authentication is optional. And then you configure your portals, either tunnel or web, and you configure your settings on the SSL VPN settings menu. And then you need a policy to specify access to the, to the access to the assets inside the organization. Okay, so for it is secure SD-WAN. Why are we talking about this? Well, number one, because I am contractually required to talk about this on every webinar from now until the end of time. But secondly, and if you guys were paying attention to uh, one of the first slides that I have where I was highlighting the uh, asynchronous connection uh, that the business in that particular slide had. Uh, most businesses, particularly in SMB, are going to suffer from this because most connections are uh, asynchronous. Essentially, that means that you have great download, not so good upload. And what happens is that as long as you're in the office, that's fine. Uh, because you're mostly making a request and you're getting the information from wherever is being served. But now, if you are enabling VPN access, 
And imagine that you had an office with, um, I don't know, anywhere between 25 and 50 employees. And they were all connected simultaneously between the times of, you know, 9 a.m. to 5, 6 p.m. So those requests were leveraging your download speeds mostly. Now all of those requests are coming through the VPN before they go to the internet and back to the VPN before they go to the user. So they are leveraging your upload. So now your ability to, to your, your throughput, your bandwidth, your ability to handle all those requests simultaneously, you're trying to do the same with what will be in this case, something around a fourth of the speed. So that's a problem. And you know, in some cases you may be able to call your ISP and request a higher tier pr uh, plan with a better upload. Sometimes that's just not possible. Sometimes they're able to give you a better download, but they're not able to do anything about your upload. All of Fortinet uh, firewalls are equipped to handle SD-WAN out of the box. And if you guys saw my SD-WAN video in the last episode we did, uh, essentially it takes about, for the most basic configuration, three minutes or so to configure SD-1 on a 48. And now if you get a second ISP circuit in there, you doubled your upload bandwidth, which you now need for all the um, VPN requests until at least you can figure out what the next steps are. All right, so there are gonna be cases where VPN is just not an option, but you still need to be able to see what the employees are doing and keep them from, think, uh, from doing things that they shouldn't. And this is where Sentinel-1 comes into play. Now, as you probably know, uh, Fortinet also offers not one, but two endpoint protection products. So why are we not talking about those? Well, personally, um, you know, I'm not talking about those for a few reasons. And they are that number one, the fact that they are two products and not one means that you have two dashboards that you need to look at instead of one. It means that you have two products that you need to configure instead of one. And depending on how you buy the SKU for uh, 40 client and 40 EDR, which is the second product, um, you also may need to host and worry about updates and maintenance cycles for the back end for those products, which is not the case with Sentinel One. Now, we wanted to focus in this webinar about the option that will get you going with minimal. Uh, amount of configuration and just the, the easiest way to get from zero to well protected. Now, in the real world, if you have a customer that already has 40 client and they want to augment 40 client with event detection and response capabilities, which 40 client alone does not have, then yes, it may be more financially feasible to augment that with 40 EDR as opposed to rip and replace everything with Sentinel One. However, if they don't have Fortinet and they want the quickest path to the best protection, Sentinel-1 is the option. So why is Sentinel-1 the option? Well, number one, the Sentinel-1 option is completely SaaS based. There's nothing to host. You just buy your licenses, you log into your portal, you start provisioning your endpoint clients. It offers both preemptive as well as on and post execution protection. And that part is important because even 40 as 40 EDR does not have a post execution protection, which means that if you somehow are able to circumvent the algorithms and infect the machine, the best it can do is contain the infection. Sentinel-1 on the other hand, has uh, remediate and rollback capabilities that are more mature. Sentinel-1 also uses uh, machine learning. So it establishes a baseline for what the endpoint is supposed to behave and it can report on anomalies to that. So it does not require um, periodic and ongoing scans of the machine in the way that traditional AV would. You also get uh, the visibility and threat hunting. We'll look at those dashboards in the management. And of course, the rollback on Windows OS. Now Windows OS makes what? Better than 90% uh, of the choice of uh, most corporate environments. And this slide actually contains a lot of content. 
And I chose to make it that way because I imagine that, um, of course, we're going to put this on YouTube after the fact. And we made our, we also make our slides available to our partners. So I wanted you guys to have the information on the slide so that if you need to reference it later, you just need to see the slide and then you're able to speak intelligently about the different aspects of the protection. <clears throat> so what's the big deal with EDR and what's the difference between passive and active EDR? Um, if you guys have been doing cybersecurity for a while, you probably have come to sense the trend that we're in where we now have a million dashboards that are giving us a million alerts at a time. And there are some companies, uh, Fortinet being a, a, one of them, that they do a really good at integrating some of the components. But unfortunately what happens is that the customers may have bought different technologies at different times. And so they have a, plethora of warnings coming from a bunch of different places and sometimes they have no context which means they don't have a story uh, so they're looking at the same thing on multiple dashboards it's hard to tell what is real and what is not and of course that uh, along with um, you know everybody saying that there is a shortage of uh, cybersecurity professionals which I believe is true uh, makes it for the inevitable alert fatigue. So people looking at the dashboards are going crazy because when something happens is that they have to investigate here, then they move to the next screen and they have to investigate there, and then they move to the next screen and they have to investigate there. I mean, when I worked at my previous job and I walked into the stock, those guys had like three and four monitors that they were looking at. Um, so that's just not feasible. And if you're offering managed services, I don't think that you have the inclination to do that because that's going to cost you guys more money and time. And the other aspect of it is that you are getting another warnings, but and the warnings will say, well, we think this is an indicator of compromise and maybe you should do this and that, but no one is willing to push the button for you because they don't want to be wrong. Well, what you need is more action. And with Sentinel-1, you get that. You get the action because Sentinel-1 is sure of what it's doing. As a matter of fact, they have a million dollar guarantee. I think it's broken down into thousand dollar per head point up to a million dollars. Um, but essentially when there is suspicious behavior, it'll alert you. When there is a confirmed threat, it'll take action. And these actions are outlined down here. We'll see them later in the management dashboard. They can be automated. So Sentinel-1 will push the button for you and they'll be right. And what that ends up giving you is uh, what I think is um, you know, the best commodity, which is time. It gives you time to, uh, that you can now allocate to other parts of your business that will allow you to be more successful. So the customer's happy and uh, you guys are happy. Also, Sentinel-1 uh, recently released Ranger, which is their IoT detection and response tool, we'll see that in the dashboard as well a little later. But essentially, think about what's happening now. You know, my case, for example, this illustrates very accurately what my house looks like. So, uh, well, not really. Before I got a, a 40 gig, I had a router that also had Wi-Fi included. And my network, which I suspect is the way that most people's networks at home is, um, was very flat. Essentially, everything was in the same IP range. And then you have NAS, you have Ring, you have cameras, you have Alexa, you have smart TVs, mobile devices, Roombas, smart lights, you know, smart everything. And then now you have this corporate-owned device where you are storing corporate information and accessing uh, corporate services in the same network as all of this other stuff that is notorious for um, being unpatched and having uh, a relaxed uh, security posture. So with Ranger, you can turn every protected endpoint into a sensor that is able to detect, not only detect these IoT devices and whatever else is on the network, but also ring fence itself from that. And I guess one thing I didn't put in here was a printer. Most people have printers. A lot of them are um, 
either Wi-Fi printers or network connector printers, printers are notorious for being full of vulnerabilities. So wouldn't it be nice? Plus uh, the fact that you probably shouldn't be printing corporate uh, papers, documents on your home printer. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to be able to isolate the protected endpoint from that printer? All right, so um, that is all the slides. So now I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to hand it over to Simon. He's going to talk about uh, the Fortinet VPN options. And then I'm going to come back and I'll talk about uh, Sentinel One. We'll take a look at the dashboard alerts, um, uh, the visibility ranger. Okay. And then at the end, uh, I'm going to show you guys if we have time um, how to take hashes that are seen by Sentinel One and import them into the FortiGate so that you can leverage them in your antivirus protection. All right, Simon, I'm going to stop sharing. You're up. All right. So thanks, Juan. <laughs> Simon's here. Hello, all, and good morning, afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I will show you how to create a basic configuration for SSL and IPsec VPNs within the FortiGate. Uh, first, we need to create a user. Uh, go to user and device, user definition to create a local user account. This is also where you will enable the two-factor authentication. Next, create a group for either SSL or IPsec and add your user to the desired group. Next will be the portal. Uh, for SSL VPN, go to VPN SSL VPN portal and edit the full access portal. This portal allows access using both web and tunnel mode. Make sure enable split tunneling is not selected so that all internet traffic will go through the 40 gate. Here you also have the option to create links to internal network resources. For the portal setting, uh, go to SLVPN setting, make sure to change the port to avoid port conflict. Uh, config the authentication portal mapping at the bottom to add the SSL VPN user group and map it to the full access portal. Select your desired portal for other users. Next, go to the VPN IPsec wizard and create a new tunnel using pre-existing templates. Set the template type to remote access and then for the, for the client can be selected. Note there's a native option for native uh, iOS, Android, and Windows. Once you're finished with the wizard, you can review your IPsec tunnel through the IP, IPsec tunnel tab. Next will be the policies. Here you can create your own VPN policy and mold it to your network requirement. Uh, I have made both for both IPsec and VPN. Uh, make sure you select the appropriate security profile for your network needs. And from 40 client, you add a new connection and you fill it all with your VPN settings. Once this is done, you enter your username, enter your password, and voila, you have a VPN. And this is that easy. The entire configuration took me about 10 minutes. So if you want a VPN, it, a simple VPN, it will take you about 10 minutes. And this is it for me. Juan? Thank you, Simon. Um, <clears throat> I do want to point out, um, during the demonstration, uh, we talked about split tunneling. Um, it's a decision that if you're deploying VPN, you'll have to make. Like Simon said, if you turn it off, everything comes to the VPN. Uh, for those businesses that maybe don't have the bandwidth, you might want to do spill tunneling, in which case only when the user is making a request that is actually ending behind the 40 gate. So they're accessing services or resources that are at the organization, inside the organization, then it'll go through the tunnel. 
Everything else will go direct to the internet. But the problem with that is that you don't have visibility over that everything else. So you won't be able to filter it. Um, if you had a solution where you instead sent an AP, if they're connected to that AP, you're still essentially, all the traffic is, is visible. Okay, so while Simon was talking about VPN, I was busy getting infected with WannaCry. So this is uh, one of the VMs in the lab. And as you guys can see, it's been infected with uh, WannaCry. And we'll see why this happened and what does that look like from the uh, Sentinel-1 perspective. All right, so this is the Sentinel-1 dashboard. And as you can see, there are 10 active threads at the moment, okay? And those are as a result of um, what I did on the virtual machine. And you guys are probably thinking, I would be thinking, it's like, well, the Sentinel-1 is so good, then how did this happen? Well, because configuration does play a part, and of course, for demonstration purposes, you can set Sentinel-1 to alert uh, only, in which case it will not stop the execution of the malware. Um, so let's look at, first I, I wanna give you guys a walkthrough of the platform, and then we'll look at um, how we deal with this. Because another reason why I wanted to show you guys uh, what happens if a machine gets infected is because in my personal opinion, no matter how good uh, the vendor says their tool is, and believe me, I personally believe that Sentinel-1 is really good, there's always going to be someone who will find a way to get around preemptive protection. And that's the reason why EDR was invented in the first place. So it's nice to see that even at this point, we can recover this machine to a state pri uh, previous to infection. So essentially we can wipe that, wipe out the whole one cry infection as it never happened. So think about you know, the use cases for that. There might be businesses that maybe they don't have a good backup strategy in place or they can't afford one. So this um, worsens the opportunity to basically, um, you know, there are other reasons for doing backup, but one of the more important ones is to protect yourself from stuff like this. Because usually in most cases, when this happened, you have to get rid of the machine and go to backup. Well, not if you have something one. So let's look at the dashboard. So from a business perspective, the first thing I wanna show you guys this is completely SaaS based. Um, you can enable two-factor authentication to the portal. Uh, it is multi-tenant. So essentially you have a global account and then other that account you have what are called sites. And we'll be focusing on the demo site today. Uh, but those sites would be your customers. And then under those sites, you can create buckets which can be both static or dynamic. And dynamic simply means that when you create it, you give it a criteria, like for example, put all Windows 10 uh, endpoints in here. And then when you deploy your clients, any Windows 10 uh, protected endpoints will automatically get put into that bucket. And that's important because the policy and most of the protection, uh, even though that there is a global setting, you can make it different based on these buckets. So as you guys can see, I have a victim bucket and I have a workstation bucket. And you probably guessed that these are protected at full and these ones are in a kind of a simulation mode where I can I actually allow the infection to take place. So we'll go back, we'll come back to that. So this is the dashboard. You have your alerts, suspicious behaviors, your endpoint. If there are any infected, they'll show here in red. And then unsolved detections, as well as uh, both active as well as mitigated, uh, are here. Mitigated is green, red is for active and unmitigated. Below that we have the visibility. So this is for essentially threat hunting. So here you can do something like uh, show me everything that you have collected from all the logs that you've collected from all the protected Windows endpoints that contain Sentinel-1 agent version, um, a version that contains four. So those are the last few versions. So now we're looking at 20,000 events and you can um, filter that. Like for example, if you just want to see URLs or if we want to see scheduled tasks, 
uh, a lot of uh, persistent threads, what they try to do is they try to get elevator permissions so that they can schedule these scheduled tasks. Now, because of the way that Sentinel-1 protects, I would say that this is not as important from a malware perspective, but there are other use cases for uh, advanced or deep visibility, and that is to make sure that no one who has certain access rights is doing something that they're not supposed to do. That's another way that you can find out what certain users are doing, where they're going, things like that. Then we have the Sentinels menu. So from here, you have your endpoints and clicking on them will give you information as well as actions. Uh, you also have an app inventory. And then here you have some details about the machine. We have the policy. This is the single most important screen that I wanted to show you guys for two reasons. Number one, here is how you're going to configure your protection. And number two, how easy it is. Now, if you don't do anything, it will inherit from the global demo site, which usually is set up to alert suspicious behavior and protect on confirmed threats. You can set this to both protect, and that will be the maximum level of protection. And as you can see, these toggle switches are on by default. There are explanations next to each one, the ones that are not self-explanatory. Now, when you enable protection, these automation levels will be visible down here. And this is how you set up what buttons Sentinel-1 is going to push for you without you having to do anything. Normally, I automate kill, quarantine, and remediate, and I leave rollback as uh, a manual administrator action. You also can automate the disconnection from the network. These are some other administrative features here. These are the ones that enable you to see all the stuff that we saw in the visibility just a minute ago. Notice that full scan is disabled because again, because of the way that Sentinel-1 works, it is not really necessary. You can enable full scan or you can enable on-demand scans to an endpoint from here. One of the options here is to do or to stop a scan, as you can see. We also have a blacklist. So essentially, uh, both Sentinel-1 and the user can add hashes to this list. And these are the hashes that we're later gonna try to import into a 40 gate. Exclusions. So you can exclude a hash, a path, file, browser. Firewall controls. Firewall controls is another thing that I would say it is not automatically needed, like it would be in some um, previous iterations of antivirus, but you can have static rules if the use case dictates, if you already know going in, you wanna block a certain thing that may not necessarily be bad, but it's not good for business, so you block it. Or if you want to allow something uh, that you wanna make sure it's allowed no matter what. Device control. Device control to me is very important because I can come into an organization with a USB and circumvent your entire network defense because I started my attack at the endpoint. It never went through the network. By the time it goes to the network, it's too late. So Sentinel-1 offers device protection for USB and also for Bluetooth. And it's not just uh, green light, red light. It has different levels. Like for example, I could allow a user to charge their phone through the USB, but the USB won't read data. So they're not able to download or uh, upload anything. Same thing happens with Bluetooth. You can configure what accesses are allowed and not. We also have the packages here. So these are all the packages by OS, by version. And notice that there are gonna be some that says agent plus ranger. And those are the ones that enable the ranger IoT detection. Then of course, your site info is here as well. Next, we have the analysis. And this is an analysis of all the threats. And you can do resolve, not resolve, mitigated, active. Also, if you have multiple threats that are happening simultaneously from the dashboard, you don't want to have to click on each one to investigate. You probably want to do that after the fact. Right now, you just want to deal with all of them. So you can click on here and you have your actions, right? 
So rollback will be one such action. And you just perform that on all of those. And we'll get back to that. Next, we have applications. So you have an application inventory for all your protected endpoints. Of course, you can click on any one of the applications to see if there are any vulnerabilities associated with them. Activity. This is one of my favorite screens uh, from the perspective of seeing everything that has happened. And not only from a security perspective, but also from an operational perspective, as well as an administrative perspective. So to keep oversight over my admins, what they're doing, when they did it, and why. Or, or to ultimately find out why. We also have reports. You can um, put them on a schedule, send them to yourselves, to your clients. Finally, we have the settings. So here we have the configuration where you would enable two-factor authentication. We have the notification. So for each of these options, you have all of these that you can receive email notification or you can send to syslog. And the integration is right here for um, the email is already built in, but here you would enable, if you have a collector and you wanna send the logs um, to syslog. Users, here is where you add your users. Now your users can have access globally or they can have access to certain sites. And within those sites, you also have roles. And these roles determine how much of this they can see. Additionally, you also have information about your sites as well as your account. And then up here, you have the help portal as well as the API documentation, which I leveraged to make that coordination and import the hashes into the 40 gate. And then your user information, and you can log out from here. So let's go back to see what's happening here. on the main dashboard. Okay, so it seems like we have everything green. So let's take a look and see what's happening. Oh, before we get into that, I almost forgot. Ranger. So this is the Ranger detection settings. And essentially there's three things you need to go, well, really two. First, your settings. So you have to turn that on. Before you do this, you have to make sure that your protected endpoints, they have um, the agent that says uh, agent plus Ranger. So on your Sentinel screen that we looked at here on your endpoints, you click on all of them and you can upgrade their software to the newest version if you have the Ranger license. So you can enable that. So you turn the scanning on, you probably only wanna look at local subnets, right? Um, and then you have an interval. And this here is particularly important. This determines how many protected endpoints or how many agents have to be in that network for it to initiate scanning. Now in this particular use case where you're sending each person to work from their house, uh, you would have one agent in, at each person's house. And then down here, you can configure all the protocols and ports that you wanna scan, as well as the intervals. The next thing that would happen is that networks would be discovered. And then you would come here and enable scan in those networks. And then after, uh, a few minutes, you're gonna start getting results about everything that is in those networks, including other protected devices. So for example, let's assume that this was my home network and we identified this printer. Visibility is great. Now I know that there's a printer there um, and you know they might or might not, uh, more than likely, it hasn't been patched in a while. I know it hasn't. So um, what we can do here back on the printer, we can click on it, 
action isolated. So you can't really isolate something you don't manage. So what this means is that you are actually isolating the protected endpoint from the printer, right? So it will not accept communications from that printer. Now think about the use cases for this, not just because of what's happening now. Think about what happens in organizations all the time. People find an ethernet port and they just plug something in and don't tell anyone. So, you know, video cameras, IOT devices, smart devices, things like that. Or also sometimes if you have misconfigurations on your Wi-Fi, right? Uh, you might have devices that are in the same VLAN, same subnet that they shouldn't be. Like for example, in an organization, there is no reason why in the network that has the workstations, you should also have the cameras. And at the same time, those cameras should only be talking to the camera that manages, I'm sorry, to the server that manages the cameras. They should not be talking to other, um, uh, to, to the workstations, right? Or, or to other servers. So if these servers are protected by Sentinel-1 and these workstations are protected by Sentinel-1, then you can essentially isolate these cameras or other IoT devices and ensure that uh, communications are only being accepted by the devices that you want them to accept. And hopefully that will make sense uh, to you guys. So let me change my screen here. Okay, so let me share this. So here we are, this is the um, desktop that we had infected. I don't know if you guys remember that there was a bunch of stuff on the dashboard. This is actually just a backsplash. So uh, WannaCry changes the picture of the backsplash with one of their own, with their own friendly little message. But as you can see, the Sentinel-1 now has a all clear. So essentially the only thing you would have to do probably, um, and, and I've noticed that sometimes after, after a few minutes, it goes back to the default backsplash. Sometimes I have to manually change the backsplash by myself. But essentially the infection is gone. All the files that were here, from the one cry infection are also gone. Now remember that this all happened uh, essentially because I decided that I wanted to set the, uh, and we're back at the Sentinel-1 dashboard. I wanted to set the policy, and let me make sure that I'm at the right group, okay. So my policies was on detect only. So this could have been a misconfiguration due to my lack of knowledge, or it could just been that I wanted to try the rollback capabilities of Sentinel-1. Uh, of course, had I had done this or this, I would not have been able to execute the malware at all. As soon as it senses it, it deals with it, it deletes it. So you won't even have a chance to execute it. Okay, so now, uh, let me change screens again. And I wanna show you how we can get those uh, blacklisted hashes and import them into the 40 gate. And we should be seeing the 40 gate GUI. So in here, we have the thread feed. So from the security fabric menu, you go to fabric connector, you're gonna create new, and you're going to choose malware hash thread feed. And essentially you're gonna point the 40 gate to where the file is, right? And then you're gonna set the interval of the refresh rate. This could be lower if you wanted to or higher. And then you can check all the hashes that are, uh, important. Now this is the easy part, right? Um, there is a little bit of uh, coding that is required. It's not really difficult. Um, essentially, all you really need is this, uh, this directory here. 
this directory here, there are going to be three scripts that essentially are the ones that do all the work. You have a get hash screen, and I apologize if this is a little bit small. I don't know that I can make it any bigger. But essentially this entire string here is the call to the API. And you can try these from the API documentation console. There is a console there where you can try calls against your own uh, dashboard. And against it, it gives you the link. And then my API key, my API key is in this config file. And then that gets the information. And then what I do is then I turn that into a text file called hashes.txt. So these are all the hashes, as you can see. And this last one is the one that we just saw uh, from the WannaCry attack. And then the second, this, believe it or not, is actually a very tiny web server. And what it's doing is when you make a request with this uh, at the end of it, it's going to serve you that hashes txt file. So essentially, um, if we go back to the 40 gig, we can see that we're pointed it to the IP of the server, port 8080, that port could be anything you want that you configure, and then file. And then what we get is this. So now this is here, which means that in our antivirus uh, security profiles, we can enable external malware block list. Um, and now it is being leveraged in our antivirus uh, protection. So anything that Sentinel-1 sees, now the Fortinet also, see, the FortiGate also sees. And by the way, because in 6.2.3, this has to be enabled through CLI, which by the way, the code is in the documentation, it's not hard at all. It looks like this. Uh, started in 6.4 and before 6.2.3, you would you could just toggle it on the GUI and you wouldn't get this uh, where it doesn't look as dark as the one on top. But uh, this is working. Okay, so essentially that is it for the demonstration. So let's go back to the slide deck. And I believe Carmen has, Carmen and or Alex have some uh, words of wisdom for you guys. Thank you, Juan. Um, uh, and thank you for showing us that great presentation. Um, guys, as we know, we're all in the business to help our customers um, get, meet their business need and make money along the way. So as you, Juan just demonstrated, you can do this with minimal resources and time with the Sentinel-1 remediation capabilities. What Sentinel-1 has uh, been able to do is offer the, the core endpoint protection in EDR solution through May 15th um, for new clients to help them while they're having to work from remote with this pandemic. Um, at, for all partners who uh, can, participate and receive SPIS from manufacturers and also participate in the Sentinel-1 partner program can receive extra cash for meetings that they set with new clients. And also if that client decides to do a POC, you get additional money. Um, now with semantic acquisition, the Broadcom has announced that they're only, they're planning to keep the, only the top 15 customers. So Sentinel-1's offering partners to double the money for clients who are existing semantic clients. Um, and now, so if you guys have, would like to learn more and get more, uh, more information, feel free to reach out to your exclusive account rep or myself. And now we'll hand it over to Alex who will share some information about hardware service. Thank you, Carmen. So just wanted to remind everyone about our hardware as a service program. Uh, we've partnered with Fortinet in order to be able to offer this competitive program. Many partners have already identified 
that customers are transitioning to a monthly consumption model. However, standing up a program in order to be able to provide this independently is extremely costly and ties up cash flow. So we offer this in order to help partners transform their business, develop services, creation, and make partners stickier with their customers. And this is available not just um, for, for customer facing assets, you can also leverage this for internal use assets. So as you build out your practice, um, things like 40 Manager and 40 Analyzer, which are key to that, that services creation. And not just for hardware either. So it's available for virtual appliances, licenses, and a variety of other different offerings as well. So please don't hesitate to contact us to find out more about that program. Next slide. So just a reminder again, please do follow us on social media and take part in the quiz. Uh, you have to be in it to win it. We have the links up there for all of the relevant channels uh, and we'd love to see you participating in that. Next slide, please. So for you, those of you who aren't already aware, uh, Fortinet have transitioned Accelerate from an in-person event this year to uh, an online conference. Please do sign up at the link there shown at the bottom of the slide. We can put that also in the chat. It's completely free and there will be a whole host of um, information, announcements and, uh, and great sessions available. So please do sign up for that. Next slide. So just wanted to highlight, there are a ton of vendor resources available directly on the vendor websites. Uh, we can provide those to you independently. We've listed them here, but there are a ton of, ton of resources available. So please do leverage those and, and go and take a look at them. Next slide. Uh, before we move, sorry, Alex, don't mean to interrupt, but for the S1, they actually also have battle cards against uh, all other competition really uh, on that the we can either make available to you guys or they're also on their uh, partner portal. So as I mentioned earlier today here we've seen uh, Sentinel One and Fortinet but we do have a selection of best of breed vendors on our line card. You can see some of the others here. Next slide. So as always, you can contact your exclusive networks account manager directly. We have listed here the contact details for myself and the lovely Carmen who manages Sentinel One and our brilliant SE team. Should you wish to reach out directly, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. Next slide. So we want to say a massive thank you for joining us here today and we hope you will join us next week for our joint webinar on Fortinet and Nozomi. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you ever so much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, thank you, guys. And so we have, so Frank, um, your rep at Exclusive, you mean your account manager? Just email me. I posted the email and we'll figure that out. Okay, cool, awesome, all right. Okay guys, uh, any final inquiries, questions, uh, just send them to me. If you guys wanna try some, some stuff out in the lab, um, I have a massive list of malware. Um, so, you know, we can, we can try it out and see if we can circumvent Sentinel-1. I tried, I haven't been able to. Everybody have a good weekend. Thank you.